This is the Unstarving Musicians Podcast. I'm your host, Robonzo. This podcast features conversations with me and indie music artists. Conversations intended to help other indie musicians be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love. Make music. Well, hello, my musician and music-loving friends. This is episode 107 of the podcast. It's also the third installment and re-release of the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, that little book I wrote. And this episode is dedicated to chapters 5 and 6, read by yours truly. It is or was a half a dozen episodes into my journey as a podcaster. Yep, these were among the very first podcast episodes I ever recorded. Before that, Creative Block came up this past week, as I'm recording this episode, that is. Comes up all the time. This time in an interview with singer-songwriter Tom Meany. Says he's going through a spell of Creative Block, not writing any new songs. I'm hoping that he and I are going to talk about it again this coming Friday, as I record this episode. You'll hear this after my conversation with Tom, I hope. (laughs) My last conversation with him was for an episode of the podcast, but it was a bust due to technical issues and failure to properly plan my contingency plan properly. I've talked about writer's block on the podcast before, and I mentioned to Tom something Uh, in our recent conversation, something that another singer-songwriter guest of mine wrote to me in a post-interview Q&A email exchange. That artist was Shannon Curtis. She said, or she wrote, I make appointments with myself to write. I no longer wait for inspiration to strike before I sit down to write. I give myself at least three hours of uninterrupted time to write at a stretch. The first hour is generally me fighting with and eventually clearing away distractions my mind wants to take me to. The second and third hour are where the real productivity happens. I've learned to treat writing like a job, not like a whenever the spirit strikes sort of whim. I think that has only built, sorry, I think that has really built my songwriting muscles. So much so that When I had a compressed amount of time in order to write my last album, I was able to go into my writing studio and write an entire record's worth of songs in about two weeks. That's what Shannon said. That's impressive, that last bit. In a sense, Shannon is saying is what she's saying is that uh, the way to stay creative is through routine and discipline. I would only add that staying creative requires practice. This will all help you excel at your creativity, and it arguably follows then that routine, discipline, and practice are the keys to creative freedom. I say this because as you excel in your creativity, you get closer to becoming an exceptionally creative individual. Then the potential for success and ultimately creative freedom comes your way. Read my full Q&A exchange with Shannon Curtis at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast. Just search for Shannon Curtis from there or anywhere on the website to read the full Q&A. And this is the time in the podcast when I ask for your support. And as friends have been encouraging me to do, I've created a new way for you to do so. It's a Patreon page. This is a place for unstarving musician fans and supporters to get a little extra a little behind the scenes of the podcast, like my icebreaker conversations with guests the theme tunes behind the podcast, a little extra bonus content, a little extra insight and access to me as a musician, author, and creator, a little extra input into the direction of the podcast, the community, the second edition of the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, a little extra goodness I've not even yet dreamed up, dreamt up, dreamed up, dreamt up, (laughs) things you can have a voice in creating. So now there are two ways to support. You can join the Unstarving Musician community by visiting unstarvingmusician.com and signing up right there on the homepage. When you do that, you get tips and insights from me and all of my amazing musician friends and guests. Or you can become a patron. Also right from the homepage, unstarvingmusician.com, or from the show notes page for this episode. Just click the little button that says become a patron. Joining the Unstarving Musician community is totally free. Becoming a patron, a mere three bucks a month. 
No long-term commitments, no spam, just unstarving musician love. All right. The Unstarving Musician's Guide, the book, is based on my personal experience as a long-time gigging drummer, vocalist, and time I've spent talking to other musicians as part of this project, The Unstarving Musician. I wrote it to help other musicians do what I did for so many years and continue doing, and that is to get more of the good gigs. The good gigs for me are gigs playing with people I admire and respect and people I enjoy being around. It also involves performing the types of gigs that bring meaning to my music world, places I want to be. That can all require a little trial and error, of course, because sometimes you just have to try things on with new people, new things with new people. You have to find out if it fits in your music world. The Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs was available as a standalone podcast read by me. Now it's going to be available here in a series of in-between interview episodes. Links to the first two in these series are in the show notes for this one. The primary themes of these two chapters you're about to hear are gaining control of your gig schedule by working with multiple bands, creating multiple sources of income by working with multiple bands, how to be an in-demand musician by being seen and heard, and a how-to on promoting your availability as a musician. All right, let's do this. I hope you enjoy this reading of chapters five and six of the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs. Most importantly, I hope it somehow helps you personally in your music journey or perhaps helps you help a friend in theirs. Working in multiple bands, controlling your schedule. Playing for more than one band has helped me control my own gig schedule. It's also required that I carefully manage my schedule. In 2013, I was working with four bands. At the time of this writing, I'm working with three bands. I'm also working as a sub for two or more bands throughout the course of any given year. My situation has become such that I want to somewhat limit the number of gigs that I play, and I prefer to only play at venues that pay well and that are fun to play. Who doesn't want that, right? Even so, there are times when one or more of my bandmates can't do a gig, which could mean that I have to miss out on a gig that I'd otherwise like to play. By working with more than one band, I have options. I can offer one of my other bands up for the gig. I've done this many times. Bear in mind, however, that having two bands isn't automatically going to get you a gig when one of your bands isn't available. Let's assume for a moment that you have a situation such as that which I described above, and that you have another band that's actually a good fit. Knowing that your other band could totally do the gig is all well and good, but it's not going to happen unless the venue in question really knows and trusts you and your other band. What if your other band has never played the venue in question? This is where a solid relationship between you and the venue can really help. Your relationship, ideally, will earn you a reputation for being dependable. In this case, being dependable could mean not only basic professionalism, but also being well-known as someone who works with other highly professional and talented musicians. Good relationships and trust are paramount, and they'll pay a huge part in your ability to do this kind of thing. So always be working on your relationships, and if I haven't implied as much, surround yourself with good musicians. We all have commitments that are external to music. Even the pros have commitments that they must work around from time to time. The beauty of working with more than one band, among other things, is that it can give you additional control over your gig schedule or your ability to consistently have gigs. Another edge that working with more than one band can give you is that different bands often have somewhat diverse styles, repertoires, and or genre focus. This is good for you as a musician and a great way to have an expanded offering for venues. Perhaps one venue prefers classic rock, while another venue leans toward current music. Multiple sources of gig revenue Multiple bands also means multiple sources of gig revenue and multiple venue sources. Access to multiple venue sources assumes that you're not the only one hustling for gigs. As I mentioned in a previous chapter, every band that I regularly work with has multiple members hustling for gigs and contributing to overall marketing efforts for the band, i.e. email blasts, social marketing, print collateral, schmoozing, etc. I can't stress enough that working with musicians who share the marketing load will make this all much easier. 
I venture to say that working with musicians who share the task of marketing a band is what makes building a full gig calendar possible. Conversely, if you're the only one hustling for gigs and working on marketing activities, you're going to have limited success getting yourself and or your band booked every month. There are exceptions to this, but not many. I personally have almost zero interest in working with bands that aren't actively marketing themselves. Consider your skills as a marketer as something that you bring to the table as a bandmate. Pro tip. Want to give yourself an edge as a working musician? Market yourself and your gigs with intention and let it be known that you market your gigs. Venues will appreciate it, and bands will too. Filling my 2014 gig schedule before December 31st, 2013 wasn't all my doing. As I mentioned in a previous chapter, half of those gigs were booked by one of my bandmates, a bandmate who played with me in two different bands. Get the picture? 12 gigs, two bands. Sprinkle in several gigs booked by me, a few by another bandmate, and I'm playing three to five or more gigs a month. The end result was gig revenue from multiple sources, i.e. multiple bands and venues. If you're the only person working on getting gigs for your bands, you may want to take a step back and look at the bands you're working with and your circle of music community influence. There are plenty of great players who are also good marketers for their respective music projects. Why not join forces with them? It's best to bring some effort to the table, and there are so many ways to contribute. Here's a list of ways to contribute to the marketing effort. Create gig posters. Promote all of your gigs on social media. Contact venues on behalf of your bands. Build a personal or band email list. Build a band and or artist website. These are just a few of the ways that you can contribute to promoting or getting gigs. If you plan to align yourself with musicians on the criteria that they're not only talented players, but also good marketers, then be a talented player and good marketer yourself. If you're devoted to one band or at a loss for where to find another band to work with, here are some suggestions. Have a discussion with your bandmates about marketing the band. Explain the importance and benefits of marketing, which are, of course, more gigs and more money. Assuming you're an active marketer for your band, show your bandmates how they can contribute. If a bandmate can do something marketing related 80% as well as you can, delegate it. Done almost always beats perfect. Teach your bandmates to be better marketers. Show them how to create Facebook events on your band's Facebook page and how to share those events or give them tips on how to approach venues for bookings. If you're lucky, your bandmates will show an active interest in helping out with the marketing and sales effort. If you're not so lucky in getting bandmates to help, consider expanding your network of musician friends and band projects. Here's how to get started in expanding your network. Go to open jam nights, sign up, and play. This is a great way to meet other musicians. If you're good, someone's going to ask you if you're available to gig with them. Run an ad on Craigslist or any classifieds platform that works in your area. Here's some suggested ad copy. Pro drummer with pro gear seeks working band. Prefer to play locally. Influences include Blink-182, Zeppelin, The Beatles, and the Dave Matthews Band. Pro tip. Ease into the multiple band thing. It is a great way to get gigs, but it can also be overwhelming. Manage your schedule and give careful thought to how often you want to gig on a monthly basis. Words of caution when going the classifieds route. Be selective. Always, always, always ask for a demo and be willing and able to provide one as well. Be prepared to decline offers if they're not a fit for you. Above all, be a nice person. Every new musician you meet is a likely asset to your network. Being a nice person will pay dividends big time. Working with bands as a sub can also reap benefits. Beyond getting hired, you may get introduced to new venues. Certainly any band you sub for plays a venue or two that you're not currently gigging at. Why not learn something useful about new venues by asking questions? Here are a few good questions. Does the band you're subbing for like playing that venue? If not, why? Who's the booking contact? What type of music does the venue typically look for? How much does the venue pay? These are a few questions that come to mind. You may think of others, and your discussion with a given venue may provide you with insight that you didn't necessarily anticipate. 
When asking for this type of information, it may be appropriate to ask for a recommendation or referral for one of your other bands. Venues are often, but not always, receptive to recommendations from their best acts. Their best acts are the ones that bring people and increase revenue. There may be other criteria, but these are the main ones. Consider this when asking for a referral. Make sure you're getting a referral or recommendation from a band that does well for the venue of your interest, and make sure that your band can also deliver. On a related note, I understand that some musicians are reluctant to share their contacts with you. In that case, I recommend you do your best to show that there are enough gigs for everyone. Lead by example and help other musicians and bands when asked. Be responsible and mindful, of course, but be generous. There's really no good reason to live and operate with a mentality of scarcity. It's so much nicer to help one another. Bands, musicians, and venues are in it together, so why not help one another? Being in demand. Be seen and heard. Getting yourself to a place of being in relatively high demand is an exercise in exposure. By exposure, I mean simply getting yourself both seen and heard. There are several ways to do this. Go see other bands. Attend and sign up to play at open mic nights and jams. Make yourself available for subbing. Sit in for a song or two at other bands' shows. Getting out there to see other bands is a great way to network and to talk about the fact that you're a gigging musician or a musician looking for gigs. Seeing other bands also fits in nicely to your schmoozing activity. You'll not only have an opportunity to meet other musicians, but you may also meet a great venue contact. Remember to bring and exchange business cards, or at least be ready to exchange contact info. While a nice business card can make you look serious and legitimate, smartphones make it very easy to exchange contact information, which should include your email, phone number, and website. More on websites in the next chapter. A cocktail napkin and pen still work also. Pro tip. When playing at an open mic or jam event, be professional by listening and not overplaying. Don't show off. Play within the appropriate style and look decent. This is your chance to make an impression. Attending and playing at open mic nights and jams can be huge. Not only will you meet other musicians, but you can show them your stuff, so to speak. If you're well-practiced and good, you're almost certain to have someone ask you for your contact info. When they do this, remember to get their contact info in return. Not all musicians are tech-savvy, so carry a pen and something to write on. You may be all about your smartphone and being paperless, but don't assume that every musician you meet is going to be the same. Once upon a time, regularly playing blues jams in San Jose, California was a huge confidence builder for me. It served to help me meet new musicians. At the time, I was very new to the San Jose music scene. People at jams are generally very friendly. Even if it's a pro jam, organizers are accommodating and do their best to make sure everyone has fun. That said, pro jams can get quite serious. Egos can run high as well as expectations. If you decide to play a pro jam, make sure that you really know your stuff and that you conduct yourself with utmost professionalism. Making yourself available for subbing can be accomplished in many ways. Often it only takes one or two contacts to result in lots of subbing opportunities. As you're meeting other bands, players, and venues, let them know that you're available to sub. Express your interest in subbing so that others understand that you view it as a great opportunity. It genuinely is. Be specific about the type of playing that you're both interested in and good at. Don't commit to a jazz gig if you don't know the first thing about playing jazz. Subbing can get a little tricky, though. You've not only got to be well rehearsed, you should also be well organized. If you're booking gigs for one or more bands that you regularly play with, subbing can complicate your gig calendar. Just make sure that you keep a gig calendar and that you update it regularly. Update it as soon as you confirm a new gig. I use Google Calendar, but one can just as easily use a paper calendar. Keeping your scheduled gigs on a band and or artist website can also be extremely useful. Venues and other musicians may refer to your website gig calendar before approaching you, so it's very important to keep your calendar up to date. Subbing can also be an awesome way to get new exposure to a new fan base and new venues. 
I've had individuals start following my regular bands after catching me at a sub-engagement. Quality exposure is largely about putting your best foot forward and being well rehearsed. Talk about getting just one chance to make a good impression. Subbing is all about making a good impression. However, I try to approach every gig that way, whether it's a sub gig or a regular one. There really are no take backs or do-overs at a live performance, although some bands I work with are not above having a little fun with onstage screw-ups. You can have fun with blatant mistakes by messing with bandmates on stage and with your audience. Poking fun at yourself can show a human and vulnerable side, which people generally appreciate. I wouldn't necessarily recommend trying this at a first-time sub-gig, unless, of course, you know the band very well, but it can help build rapport with an audience. Your fans are likely to enjoy the banter and have a good laugh with you. Then again, it depends on the gig, so use your better judgment. I'm about to slap you in the face with a recurring theme and a bit of old-school repetition. Here it is. Everything in this chapter is much easier when you're well-practiced and good at what you do, so work on your craft. I'll be frank in saying that I'm an intermediate drummer at best, and a beginner in many regards. Some might tell you I'm an advanced player, but I can assure you I'm in the intermediate realm. I study my instrument and practice regularly. This should be your routine no matter what level you're at, simply because it will make your life easier. Well, that's not the only reason, but if you want to fill your gig calendar... You'll give yourself a huge advantage by having a good learning and practice routine. Take lessons and practice, practice, practice. I read something recently about confidence and the idea of building your confidence account. One way to do this is by being really good at whatever you do so that you can deliver at a truly high level. In the gigging world, this means putting a smile on the faces of your bandmates and audiences. Sometimes it means really wowing them. Don't overdo it, though. Remember, don't show off too much. Another thing I recently read about confidence is the person with the most confidence always wins. Build your confidence account by taking your playing seriously. It'll help you get the good gigs and lots of them. Promote your availability. Promoting your availability can be as easy as emailing your musician friends and saying, Hey, I'm looking for some opportunities to sub with other bands. If you know anyone, please share my contact info. An old-fashioned classified ad can be super helpful also. I'm referring to Craigslist, but you can also run ads in print publications. Community newspapers typically let you do this for free. There are also tons of music communities on Facebook. Speaking of Facebook, here's a great community that you should check out. Balanced Breakfast. www.blncdbrk. FST.com. Funny name for a musician's network, but they're all over the country. There are also a few sites dedicated to musicians looking for gigs. I've not tried any of these, so I'm not going to recommend anything beyond a Google search for musicians looking for gigs. Seek out networks and channels in which you can advertise your availability. Just put it out there, as the saying goes. Here's another suggestion with regard to promoting your availability. Keep an eye on the calendar ahead. This year, I actually have fewer gigs than I'd like to have in the months of October, November, and December. There are less than two weeks left in the month of August, so guess what I'm doing today? Reaching out to bands with whom I work regularly, as well as others with whom I've subbed. I'm also reaching out to musicians who have asked me to sub, but for whom I've not yet been available. What am I specifically telling them? Here's my email, slightly customized for each individual. Hey man, I'm looking to add a few gigs throughout the months of October, November, and December. If anything comes up, please keep me in mind. Thanks. Pretty simple and straightforward, but I suspect that many musicians don't do this type of thing. I also suspect that many musicians lack a willingness to diversify musically to the point of detriment. As performing musicians, I believe that we must all be flexible and open to what and with whom we play with. Otherwise, we limit our gig options. A more flexible criteria should be, do I like the band? Do they pay well enough? Can I play what they need? That's it. I play dance covers, classic rock, blues, modern rock, and pop rock originals. This is all in my wheelhouse. 
Would I turn down a country gig? No, I wouldn't. If it meets my criteria, I'll play at the gig. Will I turn down a jazz gig? Probably because I'm not well versed in jazz. I'm not even that diverse as a player, yet. But my point is, don't rule too many things out. I'm not a huge classic rock fan, but much of it is challenging and fun to play, and the gigs are generally quite good within this genre. Let's recap, shall we? Get out there and network. Let people hear you play. Promote your availability. Be willing to diversify. That's it. Let's move on and dive into the topics dreaded by many of us, sales and marketing. That's a wrap. Chapters 5 and 6 of the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs. I hope you enjoyed. Learn more about the Unstarving Musician's Guide at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash book. Hey, if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you know that I'm a fan of Banzoogle. Let me tell you why. Banzoogle powers websites for thousands of musicians around the world, from garage bands to Grammy winners. They have an easy-to-use system to help you get your site up fast. Lots of mobile-friendly templates to help you customize and design your site. It's built for musicians by musicians. Here are some of the features that Banzoogle has. They have a merch and download store to sell music and merch commission free right on your website a tour calendar to promote your shows and sell tickets commission-free, mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send professional-looking emails and newsletters, integrations to pull in content from all your socials, and live support from a musician-friendly team seven days a week. Plans start at just eight twenty nine a month, but you can go to banzoogle.com to start a 30-day free trial. You can use the promo code ROBONZO, R-O-B-O-N-Z-O, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That's Banzoogle.com promo code ROBONZO, R-O-B-O-N-Z-O, to build your artist website today. Look for links to just about everything talked about in this episode in the episode show notes at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast. Thanks again so much for listening. With much gratitude, peace, love, and more cowbell.